Chapter 37 The Angel's Rebuke The year was 1947. In May of 1947, William Branham was involved in the most outstanding miracle he had yet seen. He was holding a week of tent meetings at Vandalia, Illinois. As usual, the crowd overflowed the tent into the parking lot. On the first night, Bill issued the same challenge he had been making in every city ever since his Spanish meeting in Phoenix the month before. He said, Bring me the worst case you can find and give me enough time to pray for that person, and I'll guarantee you that Jesus Christ will heal that person before he leaves the platform. A woman came forward leading a 16-year-old boy. She leaned forward and whispered into Bill's ear. Turning to the microphone, Bill announced, The mother says her son was born blind. A tense murmur rose from the audience as though they wondered collectively, Could we be asking too much from God? Bill believed God would do it. He had seen so many miracles in the past year that he knew with God, truly, all things were possible for those who believed. Laying his hands on the blind boy's shoulders, he prayed for a miracle in the name of Jesus. The minutes passed into half an hour, then an hour, then an hour and a half, with no results. Rain pelted the canvas roof of the tent. The crowd grew restless. No doubt many wondered how long this evangelist could keep praying in the face of such an apparent impossibility. After all, the boy was born blind. Bill's faith never wavered, nor did he slacken his simple prayer. He kept in mind the angel's words, If you will be sincere and can get the people to believe you, nothing will stand before your prayer, not even cancer. After an hour and 45 minutes of prayer, the boy began to quiver. He snapped his head to the left, then to the right. With a yell, he jerked away from Bill's grasp, stepping back into his mother's arms. She held him tightly while he squealed with uncontrollable excitement and waved his arms in every direction, first pointing at the lights, then at the different objects around him. He could see. The crowd surged with faith in the power of Jesus Christ to heal, Hundreds of miracles took place at once. Crippled people walked out of wheelchairs or threw away their crutches or rose from stretchers. Nothing seemed impossible. After the service ended, the ushers gathered all the discarded wheelchairs and crutches and tossed them into a pile. Bill stood behind the pulpit watching this process with joy and satisfaction. A woman and a boy walked down the sawdust aisle towards him. It was the boy who had been born blind. Now he led his mother up the steps to the platform. The boy's eyes moistened with emotion. I told Mom I wanted to see the man who opened my eyes. Bill smiled. I hope you do see him someday, because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who opened your eyes. The boy put his hand behind Bill's tie and pulled it from Bill's chest. These things through here, are these what you call stripes? The boy's mother, standing behind him, burst into tears of joy. By the time Bill got back to his hotel room, it was two o'clock in the morning. He was sharing a room with his son, Billy Paul, and his brother, Donnie. Twenty-year-old Donnie Branham, Bill's youngest brother, was helping Bill in the meetings by passing out prayer cards before each service and by helping to organize and direct the people who lined up for prayer. Eleven-year-old Billy Paul had come along for the fun of it, since school was almost out, Bill was going to let his son tag along for the summer. This hotel room in Vandalia had two double beds. Donnie and Billy Paul were already asleep in one. Putting on his pajamas, Bill crawled into the other bed and soon fell asleep. Sometime during the night, something jerked him awake. My, is it morning already, he wondered, watching a glow of light grow in the darkened room. It feels like I just got to sleep. Hey, wait a minute. The window is on the other side of the room. That's just a wall over there. The light grew bigger. Now it looked more like a luminescent cloud with no definite edges. Bill knew it was a spirit, but what kind of spirit it was he could not yet tell. When he prayed for the sick, many demons uncoupled from their hosts, and it was not uncommon for some of these spirits to follow him back to his hotel after the service ended. Sometimes he felt them in his room for hours. Sometimes he heard them making noises that sounded like tinkling bells. 
Slipping out from underneath his covers, Bill knelt by the side of the bed, closed his eyes, and prayed. His heart pounded from the terror of the supernatural. He felt the pressure of the spirit coming closer. By the time it reached the foot of his bed, he knew it was the angel of the Lord. He knew because it was the same feeling he had experienced in that cabin the year before. When the angel had met him and delivered his commission, it felt different from the demonic spirits he battled in the prayer lines. Those spirits felt evil and threatening. This spirit felt holy and awe-inspiring. Bill said, O Heavenly Father, what have you sent your angel to tell me? Your servant is listening. An answer did not come immediately. Bill waited. After five minutes, Bill felt the angel glide closer until it hovered over the bed in front of him. Then, just as clearly as he had ever heard anyone speak to him in his life, Bill heard the angel's deep, resonant voice say, Your commission was to pray for the sick. You are confining too much of the gift of healing to the performance of miracles. If you keep this up, it will come to pass that people will not believe you unless they see a miracle. These words were not spoken harshly, yet they stabbed into Bill's heart like a knife. He thought about the challenges he had been making in his meetings for the past month. Bring me the worst case you can find, and I'll guarantee that Jesus Christ will heal him. Bill didn't know he was displeasing the Lord by making that challenge. He had only wanted to exalt the power of Jesus Christ before the people. But good intentions didn't make it right. Humbly, Bill said, I'll never do it again, so help me God. He sensed the angel moving away from him. Opening his eyes, Bill saw it had stopped halfway across the room between the bed and a small sink in the corner. It hung in the air, whirling and pulsating with all the colors of the rainbow. Bill watched it a while. He felt relieved, as though his sin was forgiven. Then on an impulse he said, Does my Lord care if my little boy sees you? This was not a pointless request. Ever since Bill had started traveling across the United States, Billy Paul had become obsessed with the possibility of losing his father. Often on parting, Billy Paul would beg, Daddy, don't leave me. Mother is gone, so what else do I have on earth besides you? I'm so afraid you're going away and never coming back. Of course Bill would try to reassure him. Still, it would always give Bill second thoughts about going. Then he would think about what Jesus said, Whosoever is not willing to forsake everything and follow me is not worthy to be my disciple. And Bill would go anyway. It wasn't easy to leave his son in such distress. Now kneeling beside his bed in Vandalia, Illinois, with that supernatural light hanging in mid-air, and Billy Paul asleep in the next bed, it occurred to Bill that if his son could see the angel of the Lord once, maybe Billy Paul would realize how important it was for his daddy to leave him at times to do the Lord's work. Although the angel did not answer Bill's question directly, neither did he leave. Bill took it to mean that it was all right. Not wanting to move around the room, Bill tried to rouse Billy Paul with a loud whisper. Billy! Psst! Billy! The boy didn't move, so he tried his brother. Donnie! Donnie! There was no answer. Bill picked up his pillow and threw it at the next bed. It struck Donnie's head, making him stir enough to push the pillow off his face. Donnie! Bill whispered again. He got back a mumbled, yeah, what do you want? Donnie, wake up Billy for me. Groggily, Donnie sat halfway up in bed so he could shake Billy Paul. Billy, wake up. Your dad wants you. Billy Paul flipped over and raised his eyelids halfway. What do you want, Daddy? Donnie settled back down. Then he saw that supernatural fire burning in the air. He yelled in terror and rolled over the side of the bed away from the angel. That snapped Billy Paul awake. When the boy saw the light, he let out his own scream. Scrambling out of bed, Billy Paul jumped into his father's arms, shrieking, Don't let it get me, Daddy! Don't let it get me! Bill hugged his trembling son close to his heart and reassured him, Honey, that won't hurt you. It's the angel of the Lord that leads your daddy. He just got through talking to me, and I asked him if you could see him, 
so you won't worry about your daddy when he leaves you to work for the Lord. Billy Paul looked again at that supernatural light. This time he saw a white-robed man standing on the floor with his arms folded and his gaze fixed gravely in his direction. Suddenly the man shrank into a white mist which shot out of the room at the speed of light. Oddly enough, there seemed to be a rainbow-like afterglow that hung in the room where the angel had stood. The next morning, Bill looked out the window of his hotel room and watched as police cars drove by, leading a procession of cattle trucks loaded with wheelchairs, crutches, stretchers, and leg braces, relics left over from last night's healing service. Behind the trucks marched the people who had thrown these artifacts away. They were singing Bill's theme song, Only Believe, Only Believe, All Things Are Possible, Only Believe. Bill wept for joy thinking about how the faith of all these people had been inspired last night by one miracle, a boy who was born blind receiving his sight. True, an hour and 45 minutes was a long time to pray for one person while there were hundreds more waiting for prayer. But didn't this parade show that the effort was worthwhile? Last night, Bill thought he had understood the angel's admonition. This morning, he was not so sure he really did understand.